Hello, everyone. I, I'm having trouble seeing if anyone is out there. So if you're there on Facebook and YouTube, send me a little message telling me you're there. Oh, I see some messages. Excellent. How do you like my hair tonight? You know what you think of the new hair. <laughs> oh, great. People are there. I'm using a slightly new, um, there's a slightly new interface to the um, software that I use. So I'm um, getting used to what that looks like. Oh, here we go. A bunch of people who are coming in on Zoom. It's great to see everyone tonight. Thank you for joining me. This is really fun. So I have this wonderful new wig that I got for the 1780s <laughs> with just a few hairpins. I fixed it up and I think it looks really nice. Um, needs a little bit more work, but for us tonight, I think it will work. It looks really, really 1780s-ish, I think. Nice and big. Actually, underneath this cap, it's even bigger. You can see there's a lot of hair in there in the cap. So it's a great wig and it was really inexpensive. So um, I'm really enjoying it. We'll get it all fixed up for some personal appearances so that everyone can see it and uh, enjoy it. It's really great, better than doing it with my own hair. Um, plus I ruined my other wig, so I had to uh, I had to toss it out, fix my scarf here a little bit. Great, people like the wig. Well, I, I can't see how many people are watching. I can usually see, but as I said, they've changed this interface and, and I can't tell how many people are there. So I'll just guess that there's a bunch of you there and I'll continue. Um, if you have your comments, uh, please um, give your comments and uh, we'll get started. So thank you everybody for joining me here tonight. And um, we're going to talk tonight about um, an incredible speech given in January 1775 in the House of Lords in uh, Britain um, by the great um, honorable um, William Pitt, also known as the first Earl of Chatham, or Pitt the Elder. Some of you might know um, who he was or recognize his name, but you know, I'll be I'll be going into all of that, you know, as we um, as we go through the evening tonight. Um, so the first thing I do want to tell everybody is I'm making a big announcement tonight of um, an event coming up on April 30th of this year. That's a Saturday. It also happens to be inauguration day. And uh, I will be doing a tour on that day, Mrs. Q, with my two good friends, um, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison. And you can join us either in person here in New York City, and you will also be able to join via live stream. Uh, so I hope you'll come out with us. We'll be talking about the origination of the Constitution, um, the Federalist Papers, the Bill of Rights, um, Washington's inauguration. Hopefully we will end at Federal Hall with some sort of inaugural festivity going on there. It's still very much in the plannings, but we do have the date, April 30th. I do want to tell you that people have already requested tickets for this tour. So if you want to come in person, please um, send me a message with your email address. Um, you can send me a private message. You can send me an email at karen at patriottoursnyc.com. Let me know you want to be on the list to buy those in-person tickets. There'll be a limited number of those tickets available. Of course, the live stream tickets will be, you know, there'll be no limit on those. Also, there will be a very limited number of free admissions for anyone who would like to join us in full 18th century attire. And we were looking, we are looking for gentlemen and ladies who are interested in joining us on the tour in attire. So if you're interested in joining, let me know. Um, I think we'll probably have five or six of those tickets available, but this is gonna be a really fantastic tour. Um, many of you have seen me working with Kyle Jenks as James Madison. And if you came on the evacuation day tour, you've seen me working with Scott McScott as Alexander Hamilton. And uh, so the three of us will be working together and uh, um, they'll be talking about their role in writing the constitution and the Federalist Papers, the ratification, the Bill of Rights, Washington's inauguration. And Mrs. Q will be playing the um, provocateur um, asking some rather difficult questions as at that period in time, they are both in favor of the constitution and someone has to take the uh, point of view that the constitution may not be such a good thing. So Mrs. Q, I will be taking the role of of, as they were called in New York, the Clintonites, the faction that was against ratification. So April 30th, put it on your calendar. We'll probably be starting at about noon. If you can't make it in person, 
We would love to have you join us via live stream. On the live stream, you'll be able to ask questions and all those good things as well. So um, more about that in the coming weeks. So let's get started. So on January 26th, in the year 1775, the Right Honorable William Pitt, um, first Earl of Chatham, was retired from uh, Parliament and uh, made his way into the House of Lords to make really what is a historic speech and kind of upsetting to me that we don't study this in American history. So many of you have probably never heard of this and probably never even heard of William Pitt. So let's talk about Mr. Pitt or Lord Chatham, as he might be known. I have a few notes here. I generally know my history, but sometimes when it comes to the Englishmen and some of their roles, I'm a little bit fuzzy. So, you know, I have a few notes here to uh, look at. So um, William Pitt is also known as the first Earl of Chatham or Lord Chatham. As uh, many of you probably know, the English um, aristocrats have two names. They have their regular family name, William Pitt, and then their um, uh, peer name, which would be the Earl of Chatham. So he was known alternatively as Pitt or Chatham, Lord Chatham. And uh, he's a member of the Whig Party in England. During the time of the American Revolution, the Whig Party was the opposition party to the king, usually um, opponents to the Tories who were more often in favor of the king. The Whigs are also the party that most often supported us in America. So the Whigs, as a matter of fact, what we call patriots in the colony in, 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 in your time um, would be Whigs in my time and loyalists in your time are Tories in my time. Uh, so those would be the two political parties. Um, he was a member of the House of Commons for many years, Pitt, and uh, he eventually became leader of the House of Commons. He also served for a time as prime minister. He was very popular and for quite a long time, he was the king's most formidable opponent in the parliament. Now, um, Pitt visited the colonies in 1764, 1765, in the lead up to what we call the Stamp Act. Remember the Stamp Act? It was when um, we were forced to have tax on all of the paper here in the colonies um, in order to help support the troops that were based here. Um, so the Stamp Act. And uh, Mr. Pitt traveled to the colonies with a young man at that time called Adam Smith, who you might know, another Whig. And Adam Smith eventually wrote his book, Wealth of Nations. He traveled around the colonies and spoke to most of the merchants and things, people like that in the colonies about their view of the Stamp Act and went back and spoke out in co Congress and Parliament um, very loudly against the Stamp Act. Pitt felt it would be much better to allow more free trade in the colonies than to to um, tax the controlled trade that we had. So he was very much ahead of his time. And of course, nobody listened to him, or at least they didn't listen to him then. But he became very popular here in the colonies and a number of our towns put up statues of Pitt. And here in New York, our statue was placed at Wall and William Street. The base of that statue in your time is in the New York Historical Society. And it wasn't unusual for the Sons of Liberty to toast to Pitt, Liberty, and freedom. So Pitt was very well loved here in the colonies and seen as an ally of the Sons of Liberty or the, you know, um, uh, opponents of these taxes. Mr. Pitt will not support us when we claim our independence. He does not support revolutionaries. He only supports our right to have our grievances heard in the parliament and to not be militarily oppressed by the parliament. So it gives you an idea of who Pitt was. And you might know his son was prime minister as well. Pitt the Younger, so Pitt the Elder and Pitt the Younger. So William Pitt, first Earl of Chatham. Oh, I should also say I have in my notes here that he was an associate and a mentor to a group known as the Rebellious Lords. And these uh, nine lords entered into a formal protest um, against the Tea Act and the occupation of Boston in um, 1774. And I have a copy of that document. Perhaps I'll post it on social media so you can all see it. So these were the Rebellious Lords. And I'll tell you their names because they are heroes to the Whigs in America at that time. And they were the Lords Richmond, Rockingham, Stanhope, Ponsonby, Camden, Portland, Stamford, Torrington, and Wycombe, and um, all great friends of us here in the colonies. And you might recognize some of those names as uh, counties or towns that we would later have in America. Um, so that is the situation um, here going into um, January of 1775. So you know by now that the Tea Act has been passed. 
Um, Boston and the rather other colonies have united against the Tea Act. Boston has thrown their tea into the harbor, and in punishment, Boston has been occupied by British forces. Their port has been closed to trade. The Bostonians have been under um, terrible conditions, not able to get food, not able to trade, um, also being arrested and um, not tried by a jury of their peers anymore, being under British occupation with their new governor being um, General Thomas Gage, a very terrible situation in Boston. And instead of being brought to their knees, it has made the Bostonians more um, affirmed in their protest against the crown. And we have reached uh, by January, a situation where the other colonies are now fully supporting Boston in their rebellion. And England has found it impossible to back off of their occupation of Boston. William Pitt sees this as a very dangerous situation happening in the colonies. He is also appalled at the fact that England is using forces, military forces, to deal with something that ought to be a political issue. That the people of Boston and the colonies ought to hear their grievances presented in the House of Commons as all Englishmen have as rights, and they should not be punished with a military occupation simply for demanding those rights. And so he, at this time, is uh, rather old. Um, Pitt is going to pass away in 1778, so he's rather old. Um, he also is sick from the gout, but he has made the trip into London to address the House of Lords on what he sees as this very dangerous impending situation in the colonies. And I have some highlighted things I'm going to read from the speech here, but I'm mostly just going to um, talk about it um, as I remember it. But there are a few co quotes here that I think are really wonderful um, that, that you ought to um, hear. So Pitt says he's um, come in to you know, address the House of Lords. And he says he's come in order to open the way towards a happy settlement of the dangerous troubles in America by for preventing, in the meantime, any sudden and fatal catastrophe at Boston, now suffering under the daily irritation of an army before their eyes posted in their town. Pitt sees this as very dangerous to have a military occupation of British subjects, which the people of Boston are. And he says, my lords, he says he is really shocked that it has come to this. He says it has taken so long for you to address this situation in the colonies, that you have allowed it to proceed to such a dangerous point where there are, I think he says, 17,000 troops in the city of Boston. He says this is, this is not an acceptable way for England, the land of Magna Carta, the British Constitution, the British Bill of Rights, the limited monarchy and the representation of people in their parliament to deal with their own. He says, this, this, this is a terrible thing. He says, and it is making us the laughing stock among our enemies. He goes on to say that their only crime, the people of Boston, their only crime is petitioning for that which with a free people cannot possibly exist. Yet for asking this, he says, the inalienable privilege of Englishmen, are they reprobated and stigmatized with the epithets of ingrates, traitors, and rebels? He's, in other words, he says, simply for asking what is their due, due process to hear their complaints, their grievances heard through the legal system, the parliament, they've been called awful names, traitors, ingrates, and rebels. He says, had the early situation of the people of Boston been attended to, my lords, it would not have come to this. But the infant complaints of Boston were literally treated like the capricious squalls of a child who it was said did not know whether it was aggrieved or not. In other words, this view that the colonies are just spoiled crying children. If you had not thought that, and seen them as worthy subjects of the crown as adults and dealt with it when it began, we would not be where we are today. I knew at the time that this child, if not redressed, would soon assume the courage and voice of a man, which is 
course, where we are today. And he goes on to talk about how the Bostonians, you know, didn't complain about something light or temporary. They complained about something legitimate, thousands of troops being housed in their town at their expense their civilian government, which had been in place since their charter was granted more than 100 years ago, removed and them denied a trial of their peers being tried now in courts of admiralty and that they no longer even elect, you know, their representatives, that they are under military law. He says this isn't a small thing for them to complain about. This is at the heart of English liberties. Excuse me, I'm, I'm all itchy tonight. Please excuse me. I don't mean to be rude. Whew. I'm just, I think it's maybe some of the hairs coming out of a wig, to be honest. It's a little bit itchy, excuse me. Um, he says this is not a light thing for them to complain about. This is a serious, serious grievance and a legitimate one. So he goes on to speak a little bit more. And um, he says that, you know, you've said that these views coming from Boston are just from, you know, um, um, low lifes, he says, but not from sober, respectable, dispassionate men. He says, but from the very dregs and refuse of the people. He then goes on to say, you say that these are just merchants complaining. And he says, you describe these merchants as little paltry, peddling fellows, vendors of two penny wares and falsehoods, who under the idea of trade, sell everything in their power, honor, trust, and conscience. He says, well, I have been there, and this is an unfair representation of the hardworking merchants and people of the colonies. And this is your own small-mindedness speaking here, and it's a very dangerous small-mindedness. He says, here you are criticizing what you have never bothered to go learn about, the people of America. And he says, Keep in mind that everything in the colonies has been built by them, not by you and not by me, but by them. And he says, it is the proprietors and the tillers of the ground, men who have a permanent natural right in the place and who from being nursed in its bosom of cultivation form strong and honorable attachments to their country. It is to their credit and authority are to be given, and from those our best informations are to be drawn. In other words, we ought to be listening to the very people who have built that place. You know, the very people who have built everything there, not, not, not listening to, you know, people in the parliament whose interest is their own wealth or what, whatever they feel is, is the need to oppress the colonies in this way. We ought to be listening to the very people there. And he says, you know, much has been said about the authority of parliament in these matters and that the authority of parliament is primary, but he says the colonies are a different thing. They are a different situation. They have been given their charters and years of self-governance and we must listen to and respect the people they have elected to represent them in their governments. We have bestowed upon them the right of self-governance in the English way. And we ought to be respecting that self-government and the people who have laid that groundwork and the people to whom they've elected um, to serve them. And um, he goes on to say, he says, the facts being then, my lords, as I have stated them, what has government done? They have sent an army an armed force consisting of above 17,000 men to dragoon the Bostonians into what is called their duty. And for the chastisement of a small rabble consisting of the necessities and characteristics in doing an unlawful act have involved above 30,000 inhabitants in the greatest difficulty, oppression and consternation. Is this the way to win men to their duty and recover to them the principles of affection and British allegiance. In other words, a small number of men destroyed that English tea, yet you are now using 17,000 soldiers to oppress 30,000 people, treating them all like criminals. Is this a way to bring them into the bosom of England? Is this a way to earn their respect and their love? Of course it isn't. And he goes on to talk about how appalled he is that they would take that path. Um, he says, we're told in the language of menace that if 17,000 men will not do, 50,000 shall. And he says, it's true, my lords, with this force, they may ravage the country. 
waste and destroy as much as they can. But in the progress of 1700 miles, can they occupy the places they have passed? Will not a country which can produce Mr. Q. Did you hear Mr. Q singing? Let me, let me restart. <laughs> if 17,000 men will not do, 50,000 shall. Is it true, my lords, with this force they may ravage the country, waste and destroy as they march, but in the progress of 1,700 miles, can they occupy the places they have passed? Will not a country which can produce three millions of people, wronged and insulted as they are, start up like hydras in every corner and gather fresh strength from their joint opposition? There are too many people there. It is too big. We cannot subdue them. Even if you ravage all of their towns, how will you then occupy what you've ravaged? They will just move around and pop up everywhere. There are over three million. And he doesn't say this here, but we know that Thomas Gage warned them as well that every person in this country over the age of 12 has a firearm and is skilled in the use of it. Pitt knows this, this confrontation cannot be won. And I think he's echoing here the words even of Lord Admiral Howe himself, who repeated some of these things in his own speech to the House of Lords. Um, he says, but my lords, it's not merely three million of people the produce of America that we have to combat with in this unnatural struggle, many more are on their side, dispersed over the face of this vast empire. Whigs in the country are for them, Ireland is with them, and may even those Englishmen who may now be temporarily inactive will, once come, will, will come to support them. In other words, when people understand the cost, both in manpower and in money, and that the average people are not going to benefit from this war at all. More and more people here will support them. And you know, of course, our enemies everywhere will support them. France will support them. Spain will support them. Holland will support them. They will get support from everywhere. We will battle all of our rivals if we are forced to battle America. Very wise thinking on the part of Mr. Pitt, don't you think? Very wise man, very smart about how wars work. He says, in this alarming crisis, this distracted view of affairs, I come, my lords, with this paper in my hand um, to offer you the best of my experience and advice, which is to beseech his majesty that he would be graciously pleased to give immediate orders to General Gage to withdraw his troops before the town of Boston in order to open the way for a plan of concord and reconciliation. And this, my lords, upon the most mature and deliberate grounds is the best advice I can give you at this juncture. In other words, tell General Gage to withdraw and open plans for a reconciliation now. Hold out your hand and the people of America will accept it. He says, I have crawled, my lords, to this house today to tell you so. This is how much this meant to Mr. Pitt. He said, there is not time to be lost. Every hour is being with danger. Perhaps even whilst I am now speaking, this decisive blow is struck, which may involve millions in the consequences. And believe me, the very first drop of blood that is spilled will, will not be a wound easily skimmed over. It will be a wound that rancor, a wound, I'm sorry, a wound of that rancorous and festering kind that in all probability will mortify the whole body. In other words, the first shot will be mortal. There will be no going back from it. And this is his warning from Mr. Pitt. He also says that in the course of this, we will lose the colonies, the very jewel of the British crown. Without it, the crown will not be worth wearing. So some very interesting words from William Pitt about war, entering into a war that the people will not see benefit them. And this was echoed by other Whigs in the parliament at the time, that the people of England would see this war as, as a war of vanity for the lords and the aristocrats and not benefiting them in any way. And why should their sons and fathers and brothers and husbands go to die in it? 
a war so expensive that their children and grandchildren and later generations will be forced to pay for it. He said it will quickly lose its luster. And uh, Mr. Adam Smith warned about these very things, as well as you know, that he wrote about um, what we call economics at the time, economics, or what you call economics in your time, excuse me. So Mr. Um, Adam Smith was going to talk about the financial burdens of such a war. And of course, clearly, that England will be fighting France, Spain, and Holland as well, and some other you know, enemies from around the world that will engage and help the colonies. Um, Pitt says, this is a terrible thing to enter into. We cannot win. We will certainly lose. He does close his speech by saying, these are my beliefs as long as the Americans are willing to reach out in conciliation. If they, de if they declare themselves separate from us, I no longer am their champion as I cannot support separation from England. And uh, he ended his speech and he went home. And I think you know the rest of the story, don't you? It wasn't until very shortly after that, that that mortal wound happened. Um, April 15th, April 19th, 1775, the shot at Lexington and Concord no, that would become known as the shot heard around the world, the shot from which there was no return. So I wonder what some of you think of William Pitt's warnings about unnecessary war, um, wars that are fought not in the interest of the people of the nation and their prosperity um, or their future, but are fought in the interest of an aristocracy, um, an aristocracy only doing it for their own vanity and what they believe will be their own success, you know, financial success and interest. And a war that also will have to be paid for um, for many generations into the future. So I wonder what you in your time think about that. Very wise words from William Pitt. And, you know, uh, all of his words came true when the colonies declared our independence. Uh, Mr. Pitt was. Um, truly heartbroken at that event. And um, as I mentioned, he passed away in 1778, never seeing the end of the war, but suspecting um, that the colonies would be triumphant. You know that Pitt at one time, not in this speech, um, but in another speech to the House of Lords, he said the colonies one day will have this world. They will have it as a part of England or separate from it, but they will have this world. He said, the colonies will rule. We cannot stop that from happening. So we must embrace the colonies as being bigger than us, more powerful than us, and more financially successful than us one day. And we will either have the world with them or they will have the world without us. So um, many, many years ahead of his time, Mr. Pitt, a great man and a true friend to the colonies. So if you're in a museum sometime and you see a painting or a statue of William Pitt. I think the statue of Pitt is in a museum in Charleston, South Carolina, as well as the New York Historical Society. And you see William Pitt, Pitt the Elder or Earl of Chatham. I hope you'll remember that he was a good friend of ours and um, spoke out bravely and loudly on our behalf. You know, his view being that this was an absolute shame to England, to Magna Carta, to the rights of man, to the common law, to the British Constitution, to the Parliament, and to um, the British Bill of Rights, to treat British subjects in such a horrific manner is to use force to make them agree with you. And of course, you know that we went on to create something a bit better, um, something called the United States Constitution, um, which uh, supplanted Britain. And I believe, of course, I'm a New Yorker, that that was a far better document than anything Britain had produced before us. And I'm working very hard with my friends, Mr. Hamilton and um, Mr. Madison to present for you um, a view of how all that came about. And to give you another little hint, Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Madison will be joining us one night on a Mrs. Q Live. So I'll be telling you when that will be coming up as well. So do you have any questions or comments about my presentation tonight um, that I can answer for you? You know, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, over here, you know, behind me, I do have a green screen and um, this is the um, Haver, Haverville Room, Haverhill room in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but this that you're seeing here that blends in so nicely with the room is some of my own fabric, 
um, which I will be using to make a brand new silk dress that I will be wearing on that April 30th tour. So I hope you'll come or watch or join us just so you can see the lovely dress I will be making um, with the silk. And as you can see, it is very um, period correct and that it blends in quite beautifully um, with the background behind me. I wonder if any of you um, even noticed that this fabric was draped on a chair here next to me and was not part of um, the scenery behind me. I see a question. How did William Pitt have such insight into the American spirit of that time? Well, M Mr. Pitt did visit the colonies. Um, I know that he visited Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. He must have gone to Charleston as well as they put a statue there. He spent quite a lot of time traveling, talking to merchants, talking to farmers, to um, ship captains, to various um, people involved in industry and farming here. And um, in an effort to understand what was driving the American spirit. At that time, they already knew there was something new um, happening in the colonies, this new American spirit, and were curious that so many people considered to be commoners and dregs of society, you know, the, the lowest of the low from England and Europe, seemed to be building something quite extraordinary here in the colonies. Now, the, the Tories knew that the the financial possibilities in the colonies would far exceed London and England. They knew this very clearly, and they worked tirelessly to constrain the growth of the economy here in the colonies. Pitt knew this as well, but his view was that this economy here ought to be unleashed to reach its potential, that it would be great for England as well. Um, but the Tories, of course, had not been here. They were greedy. They were selfish. They were inherited wealth mostly, and they wanted to constrain competition from here in the colonies. So they continued that idea that the colonists were, were dregs, that they really couldn't build anything that great, that they were, you know, that this was just a myth that all of this greatness was happening. So Pitt boarded a ship and he came here himself. Um, there were other noblemen who came to see as well. He's the most notable of them, him and Adam Smith. They traveled around, they met with everyone. They got the view of the colonies um, through the colonists themselves, their thoughts on things like the Stamp Act. And I uh, went back and talked about what they said. And William Pitt saw the greatness of the colonies. He just might have been a very perceptive man, very intelligent man, um, a man far ahead of his time. Um, very fascinating, interesting man. Um, let's see, if you have anything else, any other questions? I do want to um, encourage everyone as well to get in touch with me, however you'd like, either on social media or through email, however, and uh, let me know if um, any of you are interested, if any of you have specific questions you would like Mr. Hamilton or Mr. Madison to address when we all meet. Um, Mr. Jensen asked me, is William Pitt connected to Pittsburgh? Absolutely. I, I believe everything in America uh, named Pitt is named either, if not for him, then his son, Pitt the Younger. Um, but but it, it is him or his son. So um, everything Pitt, uh, Pinst Pittston, Pennsylvania. An interesting thing about that area of Pennsylvania, um, the area around um, Pittston and Wilkes-Barre. Um, Wilkes-Barre is also named for two radical Whigs um, in the House of Commons in England, um, John Wilkes and Isaac Barra, um, and also nearby Pittston. So all named for those radical Whigs in the House of Commons. Um, somebody tells me the Fort Ticonderoga reenactment of the snowshoes battle, end of February, we will be there. Sir, please send me detailed information about that reenactment. I will be very happy, Mr. Q and I, to come up and meet you and for me to record some video there. Um, so please send me information about that. I would very much like to come as I know Mr. Q would like to come as well, and I will promote that too. Um, uh, Mrs. McCain tells me, um, I thought that lovely fabric was part of the room behind you. Thank you. It shows my good judgment occasionally shines through. <laughs> and she says, regarding Mr. Pitt's speech, excellent. There is nothing new under the sun. True, my friend. Very true. Um, from my cousin, Mrs. Patterson. 
Um, is there a relationship between John Wilkes and John Wilkes Booth? John Wilkes Booth undoubtedly was named for John Wilkes. Um, John Wilkes was a big hero to the Patriots in America. Um, they toasted to him. Um, Alexander McDougall in New York was known as the Wilkes of the colonies. Um, John Wilkes went to jail for a brief time for publishing work in London that um, oh, lampooned the aristocracy and the king. He went to jail briefly for, for printing it, but he was a very smart gentleman and he pointed to a little loophole in the law that said that members of uh, parliament could not be jailed for what they published or what they said, and they had to release him. Uh, so yes, John Wilkes Booth, it's my guess, was named for John Wilkes, um, as he was uh, very, he was a hugely popular among the patriots in America. Um, Ms. Fano says, I am gorgeous. Thank you so much for the compliment. The wig is not quite there. It needs a little bit of work, but for something Shall I tell you how much I paid for it? Only $25. <laughs> and right out of the bag with just a few hairpins. Not bad. Um, once I've had a chance to do a little bit more with it, I think it will be superb. And, you know, it, it saves me from having to uh, curl one of my more expensive wigs. Um, it looks better than my expensive wigs. Enough of that. Um, Ms. Kozlowski says she noticed the fabric and glad it will become my new fashion accoutrement. Yes, it will. I'm going to make um, going to make a gown that's known as a zone front gown. Some of you might know that the front will come in a diagonal like this, and then there'll be another diagonal, straight diagonal piece, and the stripes on the top are going to run this way, and the stripes in the middle I think will run vertically. I think it'll be quite beautiful with a full skirt. And let me know, let me know, do you think I should make the petticoat, the underskirt out of this, or should I make it out of a complementary silk color? Let me know um, what you think would look best. I could make a petticoat out of, you know, the green. Well, I already have a green one. Think of another color. Um, maybe a beige or a pink petticoat, or for those of you who are better at color and art than I am, I am not very good at this, maybe, you know, a complementary color that I'm not even aware of that would go with these. Um, let me know your thoughts on that, um, what I should maybe make the petticoat out of if you have another, you know, um, color idea. Um, let's see. Someone tells me, edit Mrs. Q. Oh, let's see. Um, oh, Liberty Seeker says on YouTube that I should check out the Fort Ticonderoga website. They have the dates for the reenactments. Sir, I will do exactly that. And um, I will plan to be there as Mrs. Q. In my winter, I'm wearing my winter quilted jacket with some modern, modern um, long underwear under it, but we won't tell anyone. Um, Ms. Fano says complimentary would be beautiful. I agree, but I'll tell you, I have no artistic or color matching ability. It is simply by blind luck that this fabric matches the room behind me. <laughs> I could never have done that um, purposefully. So if you, if someone would like to send me a color swatch, post swatch, um, post it or email it to me, um, I, I would be very grateful because I, I surely cannot pick a complimentary color for this. And I, I might also you know, need a color for a silk hat. So another complimentary color. I don't think my blue one will go with that. Um, um, Ms. Kaler says gold. Oh, gold would be so beautiful, wouldn't it? Maybe a slight gold color shifting silk. The color shifting silks were so popular in the 1780s. Maybe a, a, a gold to copper color shifting silk if I can find one. Of course I can find one. Um, or a sage, Ms. Fano says a sage. Oh, a lovely color, right? So thank you for your um, suggestions. I will tell you before I can make this, I have to make a new set of stays and I will be documenting that on Facebook and YouTube. I'm hoping to start the project tomorrow and um, maybe we'll even show you fitting them to me if those are, that isn't too risque. I don't know, but I might show some video or pictures of me learning how to fit them properly because the ones I'm wearing look okay, but they don't fit me properly. And if I make a silk gown like this, it won't hang properly. So we need to fix the stays. And um, so thank you all for tuning in tonight and for helping me out with my various projects. 
Please remember Mr. Pitt as a great friend to America. Oh, Mr. Jensen wants to know, was England in debt for many years after the Revolutionary War? You might know, Mr. Jensen, that England was deeply in debt at the start of the Revolutionary War. They were already in a situation of near financial collapse. And just prior to the outbreak of the war, the Prime Minister, Lord North, had begun to reduce the size of the Navy, the Royal Navy. And so England was in dire trouble even before the Revolutionary Revolutionary War. So yes, it was uh, it was a disaster for England, the Revolutionary War, in, in many ways. Um, from YouTube, which territory did England receive in the Treaty of Paris? I do not know. So if someone knows the answer to that question, I do not know. I know that the treaty at the end of the French and Indian War, they received some lands in Canada and what is today around Louisiana. Um, some people wanted to give them the entire frontier um, west of the Mississippi, which wouldn't have worked, but I'm not sure which territory English got at the, at the Treaty of Paris. If somebody knows the answer to that question, please, you know, let me know. Um, thank you, Mrs. McCabe. Good night to you and Mr. McCabe. Um, good night to everyone, and I will see you next week, and hopefully in a week or two, we'll be joined um, by Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Madison. Um, a fun night for all that will be. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week and a healthy week. And I will see you again next week. Good night, everyone.